Hello everybody online. Uh, today I'm gonna give you a talk on the modeling deformation and failure behavior of uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, I didn't do a study on it, but most likely this is the first talk um, about uh, deformation and failure behavior of, uh, of batteries in our current uh, at least mini symposium. Uh, I hope with this talk I could really give you some uh, information and uh, maybe some uh, research idea or methodology uh, about uh, the, um, the study on the lithium ion battery from a mechanics point of view. Uh, this work is done by myself and in a very close collaboration uh, with the Junior Zhu and uh, Professor Thomas Vispicki uh, at MIT. So, why lithium ion batteries? Of course, this is related to one of the most pressing issues, which is the uh, climate change. Uh, we know in 2015, about 200 nations signed the Paris Agreement to ensure we are not exceeding 1.5 degrees C global warming uh, by 2050. Uh, the EU accordingly announced the strategic vision uh, which is this uh, net zero or carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, how do we get there? If we look at this um, yearly CO2 emission diagram, uh, at the current moment, we are having around about or less than 4,000 million ton. And if we just look them by categories, uh, actually the most significant contributors to this emission is from transport, transport, industry, and power. In about 30 years, uh, we're really talking about to cut the CO2 emission almost to zero uh, for all of these three uh, industry sectors. How are we gonna get there? Here's action plan in the transport sector. Uh, there are many cases defined. Uh, what we would, would like to focus on is this green one. Uh, because this is according to the, the Paris Agreement, which leads to uh, net zero CO2 emission. How to get there? Uh, there are basically two measures. The first one is share of public transport. Uh, and the second one is the share of electric vehicles, so the EVs um, in urban fleet. If we just look at the, um, uh, the net zero case, we're really talking about 100% of EVs in both cars and buses. And this is really telling us the trend. Uh, we need to get the EVs into our daily life. Uh, so after this long introduction, I hope I, I, I uh, convince you that the EVs are getting really uh, more and more important as one of the main components in EVs is the battery. Uh, in the most of the uh, EVs in our current market, they are driven by the lithium ion batteries. So they have many advantages, uh, so as you can see here, um, but uh, they're not perfect yet. Uh, there's also one or few challenges, for example, they're now pretty costly and uh, recharge efficiency shall be optimized. Uh, but uh, as mechanic people, uh, or focus in especially failure, uh, there's one really significant challenge, which, which is this uh, battery safety issue. Uh, I think we all heard of the uh, accidents or fire, especially that this EVs cost. The most uh, one of the most recent one is this uh, famous accident in 2018. Uh, so a Tesla is completely burned out. Uh, how how could that uh, how could that happen? Uh, if you just look at this uh, small experiment uh, on the corner here, you can see uh, here's a battery and there was just a very small impact on this battery. Uh, and uh, you can see the failure and you can see the explosion and the fire. Uh, so this is really something significant for the battery uh, safety issue. So how do we do the modeling of battery deformation and failure behavior? So here I'm giving a general methodology. 
which is pretty similar uh, as what we do with the metals. We start with a mechanical test. Here I want to give you a very brief introduction about the lithium ion battery. Uh, so this is some, uh, some level. So we start with the cell. So how the cell is, uh, is uh, constructed, uh, basically there are a few uh, layers and these layers uh, forms the cathode and the anodes and in between their separator. And we just repeat all these layers, uh, it forms a cell. And we put a few cells together, it, uh, it, it goes into a module. And a few modules together, then it forms a pack. And in a modern EVs, uh, there are quite some packs in the in 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 the bottom uh, of the of the car. And this is the the structure. And uh, as you can see, we can load it quasi statically or in, in dynamic mode to simulate this. Uh, what we require is pretty simple. We need the constitutive models. Yeah. Uh, we need models to, to describe the deformation, we need models to de describe uh, the failure. So there are some models available, I will talk about that uh, a little bit in detail later. Uh, once we have the constitutive models, uh, then we need to have the final element models. Uh, over here, corresponding to this uh, hierarchical natures of the battery, uh, we could form homogenized model, which means we treat all the uh, cell and different layers as one continuing medium. Or we have a detailed model, where, or we have RVEs, uh, where all these different layers are uh, represented. Uh, and there are different elements and solvers, of course. Um, then, after these models are, are kind of uh, constructed, then we can do uh, prediction or calibration of the parameters. Uh, in the end, we try to formulate a experimental and numerical study uh, to, to, to get the deformation and the failure behavior. So this is very similar to what we do with the metals. Here I want to show you uh, the details, how we arrived there. Um, let's talk about some um, challenges and the state of the art of the battery uh, simulation. Here I'm really talking about the homogenized models. So, so we're not about we're not talking about all these layers. We're training the whole battery as a continuum media. Uh, maybe you, the first thing you can imagine as all these um, uh, cathodes and anodes are consist of the coating materials, which are in the end granular materials. Uh, there's very strong pressure dependency when there's deformation. Uh, it is uh, it is much influenced by the pressure, so the tension and the compression is completely different. And you can also imagine when we just do the do the tensile load in this direction, uh, the resistance is almost zero, yeah, uh, because they are just uh, attacked uh, stacked to each other. And another thing is called the densification. So that means when we just uh, deform. Like we, we, we perform a compression load along the out of plane direction, and the material will densify. So the, 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 the volume will be changed and the, the hardening curve is, is typically showing in a such a way. So we need to formulate a, a model that can represent that. Uh, and of course, there will be anisotropy because if we just uh, compress it that way, uh, vertically and horizontally, the behavior of the material is easily different, you can see here. Uh, and there are models already existing to, to render this effect. Uh, the challenge here is really to, to, to get the failure behavior predicted. As you can see, this is one of the experiments when we just uh, do an indentation on a battery. There's a very clear shear fracture formed. So we're at the moment missing a, a model that can really predict uh, this kind of failure. So that's the, the point uh, this, this talk is about. So here is our experimental plan. Uh, we have one large cell battery, which is exactly from the EVs. Uh, it's uh, called pouch battery, so it's, it's, it's like a pouch. 
uh, we are indenting it with a cylinder so it's it's like a plain strain um, indentation so uh, the the difference of this uh, two indentations is we're having two different indenter size uh, one is with a 15 millimeter diameter and the other one is with about 29 millimeter diameter uh, but for both cases you can clearly see a very clean sharp shear fracture is formed just across all these uh, layers and if we just look at the force displacement curve uh, it looks uh, quite similar to an indentation test uh, at the same time we are also recording the voltage change so you can see the battery is uh, uh, the voltage is dropped significantly uh, once we have this um, fracture is formed for both cases so that means uh, the failure of the battery is really triggering a the um, the short circuit and so on and uh, uh, leading to a fire and explosion in the end so that means we need really to get a very good model to predict uh, this uh, failure behavior so how do we model the failure behavior? We go to our collection of uh, material failure models, uh, typically used for metals, of course. Uh, since there is class deformation, now we're talking about ductile fracture. We have this classic uncoupled models and coupled models. And in, and in between, we have the hybrid damage mechanics model uh, that our team has been developing in the past years. Um, it basically takes the uh, strain defined measure, uh, which is usually dependent on the stress state like triaxiality and load angle, to indicate the damage initiation. Um, before this point, the material is perfect, so no damage is coupled. Uh, and after that point, uh, we have the damage induced softening and it influences the plastic behavior. Uh, Ideally, we assume, we assume a linear um, damage accumulation law, uh, but that has been also slightly improved uh, in the next. Uh, and when this damage evolution reaches a critical value, uh, which is called decrit, we, we assume it, uh, it, uh, the material goes to uh, their final uh, uh, serving life and it triggers the fracture. So this is the basic idea of, of the model. Uh, it is um, distinguished between damage and fracture, and it is simple to use. To make the model more general, we also included the modifications to accommodate non-proportional loading uh, effects, and also we introduced the cleavage fracture. Uh, it was even extended with a non-local formulation of the model. Uh, recently, we also added uh, dynamic loading effects into the model. Uh, so we're not going into details of all these extensions. Uh, if you're interested, please refer to the studies. Uh, the main interest here is how do we bottle this concept into our modeling framework of battery. So how do we describe the battery deformation behavior? Uh, we're using the classic dashboard flag model, which was initially developed for metal foams, um, but we found it quite uh, effective uh, in describing battery uh, behavior. Uh, so the model is uh, absolutely pressure dependent. As you can see in the, in the yield locus, this red uh, solid curve in the PNQ space. Um, and by setting different uh, minus PT and the PC value, we can have different tension and compression um, cases. Uh, and we are also adopting a volumetric strain hardening, meaning we are fixing the PT as a constant value and the yield locus is only expanding uh, like this uh, with respect to the volumetric plastic strain. Um, so this is how a hardening curve will look, look like. Uh, and the two important parameters of this uh, plastic model is this K and KT. Uh, they are basically describing the, the shape of the yield locus. For example, if we look at uh, this parametric study here, when we have a rather small k value, here is 0.1, uh, we can see the yield locus 
actually is pretty close to a straight line. So if it's completely straight, that is our Mises model. Yeah. So it's completely pressure independent. Uh, when the k is increased uh, to one and to two point nine, as you can see here, um, the yield locus is really getting more and more pressure dependent. Uh, and here are the three typical loading cases corresponding to um, unaxial tension shear and uh, uni, un, un, uniaxial compression. Now you can see how the yield locus will be uh, will be different, or the yield strength will be different at this different uh, uh, different loading cases. Uh, this is the plasticity model, uh, but how do we modify it to to model damage and failure? Um, this is what we have uh, proposed, and exactly adopting the similar strategy as we did for metals. Uh, so we firstly introduce a D to really get the uh, softening uh, behavior into the into the material, and then we have the indicator for the damage initiation. So it can be a strain based or stress based. Uh, and here I'm giving an example of uh, this indicator when we have, for example, the Cockcroft uh, Lethem criterion um, or the Johnson Cook criterion. Uh, once the, the damage initiation is reached, then we start the uh, damage evolution behavior. Uh, in this case, it is formulated with respect to the uh, maximum principal strain. Uh, and then when this D reaches a critical value, in our case here is one, uh, it goes to the final fracture. How did the model calibrate it and how did it uh, work? So we start with the, with the plasticity part, the Dustbath flag model. We can see after we get the hardening curve from uni compression test, uh, it gives quite good description uh, in terms of force dis displacement curve uh, for this uh, cylindrical uh, punch test. Uh, and uh, this is one diameter and for the second diameter, the correspondence is also quite good. And for the failure criterion, we're giving a little bit uh, uh, extra attention uh, because we want to explore uh, all this uh, simple and possible failure criterion uh, since it's a rather new uh, material. And uh, we also want to focus on the simple ones uh, because we don't have too, too many experimental data. Uh, so first we adopt three stress-based criterion and then we have three strain-based criterion. They are the maximum principal strain, uh, constant volumetric strain, and the uh, cockcroft lathem criterion. Uh, they have all one single parameter to calibrate. Uh, and we have the Johnson-Cook criterion, which uh, have two um, uh, parameters to cal calibrate. So the last two are mixed in the mixed stress strain space the calibration. So we basically use one test to do the calibration, which is this uh, uh, compression, uh, which is this uh, test under uh, with the diameter of 15 millimeter. Uh, the calibration is also pretty straightforward, as you can see uh, for this maximum principal strain criterion. When we just change this critical value, you will result in different uh, drop point of the forced displacement curve and they're corresponding to the different failure pattern. In this case, it's really pretty uh, wild uh, for the battery. And this is uh, what we have for the constant volumetric strain criterion. Uh, the principle is the same. Actually, here we get a slightly better uh, fracture pattern prediction. It's, uh, it's getting a little bit close to to a shear fracture. So here it's good, it's only, only calibration. So how did the cockcroft lathem criterion go? Uh, here's the video that we recorded to show the crack initiation and the propagation uh, process. Uh, we can show, we can see uh, the crack is really giving a quite uh, shear pattern 
if we just locate the right moment, we can see um, this criterion really gives us through three th through thickness uh, crack and in a very similar pattern, even in a similar angle to our experimental observation. Uh, this is very important. Of course, we want to look at also the Johnson Cook criterion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it uh, requires two parameters, so we had to use to experiment both to do the calibration. Uh, and uh, the result is also very uh, positive. It also gives a quite good shear fracture uh, pattern as our experiment. Uh, of course, um, this is uh, now not, not a validation, but, uh, 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 but a prediction again, because this experiment is also used to do the calibration. Um, and the uh, uh, crack pattern is also quite uh, quite uh, similar to it. Now the models are calibrated. Uh, let's try to validate them. Uh, for the validation, we are using the indentation test with a diameter of 28.6 millimeter. Um, so first, these are the three stress-based criterion. We can see uh, they are all underestimating the, the fracture moment. Um, these are the two strain-based uh, criterion. Uh, uh, they're also under and, uh, and overestimate the criterion, uh, the, the, the fracture moment, and only the uh, cockcroft leptum criterion is giving a very reasonable prediction of the fracture. If we just put it into a bar chart, this is more clearer. So the RAT, which is for the smaller diameter, is used for calibration and the blue is used for, for validation, uh, of course, except for the Johnson Cook uh, model. Uh, you can see among all of this, uh, the CL, the Cockfrog Latin, is really giving the best performance, one single parameter. Uh, the more important feature is to validate our fracture pattern. So this is the, uh, the fracture pattern for, 20, uh, for diameter 28.6 millimeter. Uh, we can see for this uh, stress-based criterion, they are not giving anything likely. Uh, and for strain-based criterion, actually the constant volumetric strain is, is something similar, uh, but uh, it doesn't give a through thickness uh, fracture. Uh, only the uh, CL and the Johnson Cook criterion can give a uh, good uh, shear fracture, which is exactly the same as the experiments. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk. So first of all, I, I hope uh, I could uh, convey you that dash pad, pad flag model can give reasonable description of deformation behavior of, uh, of lithium iron batteries. Uh, and uh, with our study here, we really successfully extended the model to account for fracture, uh, even with the different failure criteria. Um, among these seven criteria, actually, the maximum principal stress, shear stress, and principal strain, constant strain, and the more clone criterion uh, all fail to predict the shear fracture. I didn't show all the details uh, during the talk, uh, but actually, you can find all the details in, in our paper. Uh, uh, lastly, but not least, the, the Cockfront Latium and uh, Johnson Cook criterion uh, could predict both uh, force dis displacement curve response and the shear fracture very well uh, for our uh, indentation test on the batteries. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and looking forward to a very fruitful discussion online.